Well, everybody just joining, uh, we'll just give another minute or two for people to uh, trickle in and then we will get started. We've got a nice full presentation session. As a reminder, uh, there will be a Q&A document linked on the website, um, which you can use to ask some detailed questions from our panelists as we likely won't have time to, uh, to answer them live. Um, but if we do, I'll let you know. Uh, you can use the chat box to message uh, me about any technical issues we're having, but I'm also watching the webinar, so uh, hopefully I will catch those kinds of things. We'll start in just a minute here. All right, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the second round of lightning presentations. This is session 2A, System and Root Performance Monitoring uh, and Applications. Uh, I'm your host and moderator, uh, Willem Klobenhauer. I'm, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto's Transit Analytics Lab. I'm really excited to hear uh, about this session because I spent a good four years uh, doing this type of performance analysis uh, on transit as part of my dissertation. So I'm excited to hear what people have to say about this. Um, just as a quick reminder, we're doing lightning presentations. So they, they will be six minutes. I will be timing them. You may hear me chime in with a little sing song ding when there's 30 seconds left. That just, uh, just to give a heads up to the presenters. Um, if you have any questions, I recommend using the Google, uh, the Google document Q&A, which is linked on the Union Station webpage next to the topic name. You can follow that link to ask your questions about different presentations. Um, and that way you can get some more detailed answers that way. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can, you can send me a message. Um, and if we do have time at the end, um, I'll open up the Q&A. I'll have a look at the Q&A box for some questions there. So without any further ado, uh, we'll start with uh, Howard Chang. So Howard, if you wanna share your screen, unmute and turn on your video, all at the exact same time. <laughs> and I will line off. Great. And uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Howard Chang, and I am a principal planner from the region of Waterloo, Grand River Transit. And today I'll be talking about our recently upgraded transit data reporting system and how we use it to better inform our planning decisions. So a little bit about ourselves. Um, Grand River Transit is the primary transit service provider in the region of Waterloo. We are located 100 kilometers west of the city of Toronto. We are also one of the fastest growing regions in Canada. We operate a mix of local routes and high frequency express routes. And in 2019, we added a new light rail line to our system. Um, our annual ridership is 21.9 million passengers and our goal is to reach 53.6 million by 2031. Uh, in terms of our daily boardings, it's around 100,000 during the pre-COVID-19 levels. So our transit data reporting system, or TDRS, is an online reporting server that produces reports using AVL and APC data uploaded from our conventional fleet. The reporting server is powered by Microsoft Power BI and SQL Server reporting services. The system has over 30 million records of uh, data dating back to 2012. And TDRS applies algorithms to sanitize uh, data and produce reports relating to our service utilization, passenger crowding, and schedule adherence. And so overall, we use TDRS for analyzing route performance, uh, reporting monthly system performance and to respond to operational issues. 
So as we expand our transit system, we realized there were several challenges with the current setup of TDRS. Uh, one, we have a need to efficiently monitor our system performance. Uh, this could be addressed by implementing a system performance dashboard. Two, uh, we have multiple data sources available, but they need to be aggregated in order to report them effectively. Uh, case in point is uh, we have a new LRT boardings data set available, but it's not yet integrated with our bus boardings data set. Uh, and three, our existing reports are not flexible enough to address our uh, specific data needs. Uh, so to address this, we added the capability for users to create custom reports. Uh, so this is an example of our monthly system performance dashboard that we use to communicate to upper management the overall performance of our transit system. It has an interactive interface. So this allows users to quickly drill down from the system level down to the root level. We incorporated new data sets such as LRT boardings, revenue cost of service, boardings per hour. Uh, the pie chart shows a distribution of system boardings by the service type. Uh, and you also have uh, important system level metrics shown in the middle. And at the bottom, you can look up for individual route performance. And this is a customized report that we created, which tracks passenger loads by stop order along a trip. Uh, each column represents the scheduled departure trip, and each row represents the stop along the trip. Uh, passenger loads are shown as the color-coded cells, uh, with yellow and red showing the loads approaching our crowding standard of 45 passengers. So in this example, Route 61 picks up a lot of passengers between Preston Parkway and Conestoga College uh, in the morning. And this visualizer tells us that there were still very busy trips between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. and they're shown highlighted in, uh, in the red here. So in response to the overcrowding, we added short relief trips between the crowded trips and they're shown in the light blue uh, in between the, uh, the regular trips. And as you can see, they're doing their part to alleviate the passenger crowding. Um, this report can also be adjusted with uh, scaled back uh, crowding standards. And we use it um, during the pandemic uh, to identify underused trips uh, and for uh, service reductions. So in conclusion, um, we significantly improved our passenger data reporting efficiency by creating new dashboards, which makes reporting a lot more consistent and less time consuming. Uh, we also created custom reports that helps us to respond to specific data inquiries. Uh, having, and we also have new reporting visuals that provide valuable insights on service performance. And in terms of next steps, we, we plan on further enhancing TDRS by um, enhancing the user accessibility. Uh, by sharing to new users and streamlining the overall user experience. And we're also planning to enhance the reporting efficiency by adding new KPIs, maps, data sets, Same. and custom reports. Um, so more details of the dashboard and the reports are available in the long version of the presentation. Uh, my contact information is shown below. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much, Howard. Um, Joey, if you wanna start sharing your screen and video and audio. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Great, you can get started whenever you're ready. I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> okay, um, you can see this is uh, two of our wonderful employees at Metro Transit in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, just on the bottom right of this picture, you can barely see our go-to card reader, our automatic fare collection. And what you can't see just below the picture are the APC infrared beam counters. And I'm going to talk about how we use our AFC system and our AP system, combine the data to get um, service scenarios for a new BRT line. <clears throat> so one of the questions we were interested in is how much dwell time can we save by changing how uh, we space stops along a BRT route. So this is a planned RTL or BRT route. 
and you can see these uh, set stations and proposed stations. Um, one of the, or some of the features of BRT that we implement on these RTO BOT routes are off-board fare payment, all door boarding, and, um, excuse me. <clears throat> and we have wider doors and more interior space. So all of those, those four things sort of contribute to um, shorter passenger dwell time and, and possibly more, um, less variable dwell time as well. And then additionally, we have signal priority and bus bulbs. So the bus doesn't pull out of traffic. And, and those two things also contribute to shorter dwell time, but not the passenger portion of the dwell time. So the question is how, how much dwell time can we save by grouping stops together, consolidating stops, and, and how much does that improve the reliability? Uh, our data are basically from two almost unrelated systems. <laughs> The AAFC, the fare collection system, provides us with what vehicle uh, the card was tapped on, what time the card was tapped, and uh, the fare class and stuff like that. <clears throat> what we get out of APC is when the bus departs the stop, it, it sends a message that says, this is what time we arrived at the stop, the, time, the first door open time, the last door close time, the departure time, and then a count of the number of ons and offs by door. So if you have a vehicle with two doors, you get to see um, how many people got on each door. And because of that, we can, we can estimate um, based on the APC counts, subtract the AFC and get our estimate of cash boardings, uh, which aren't tracked at the stop level, only sort of at the trip or, or block level. Um, but because the AFC isn't matched to a stop, we have to do that ourselves. And so we just match it to the previous door open time. Um, we use all this information to build a, a, a model of dwell time, passenger dwell time. It's a kind of a fancy model. Oops. And this, this is sort of the outcome of that model. It's a Bayesian model that takes the, um, the total ons and offs at the front door and the ons and offs at the back door and estimates the boarding time at the front door and the boarding time at the back door and then uses the largest boarding time or passenger activity time per across the two doors, right? The idea is we have these BRT routes, you're allowed to board at either door. The total amount of time is really the maximum time at one door, not the sum of the boarding time for all individuals. And the result is uh, we get about 5.7 seconds just to stop the bus for passengers and open the doors, even if no one boards. If you open the doors, there goes six seconds. So that's one place you can save time by reducing the number of stops. Um, Off-board fare payment takes only three seconds to board a passenger on the front door and 2.9 seconds on the back door. Cash is quite slow at almost seven seconds. And surprisingly, uh, no fare payment method for onboard fare payment collection is slower than offboard fare payment collection. And that's actually because this is for pay leave routes. Some routes we collect fare on exit instead of on entrance. And there are ways that people get in each other's way more or people forget that it's a pay leave route and they try to pay so things aren't quite as smooth as offboard fare payment. You can see in the upper right corner there, people are uh, doing a nice job of using both doors. Uh, they can learn to use both doors. It works really well. Uh, what we found from our existing routes was that about 25% of people use cash and about a little over half the people use the front door for boarding on BRT routes. So we developed three service scenarios that are all variants of stop spacing. The existing stop spacing is about, uh, wow, what is it, like 200 meters or less, and that results in 183 stops across this route. The new stop spacings will be 400, 560, or 640. Mm -hmm. And so to compare the, the, um, the scenarios, we reassign boardings and alightings from existing stops to 
the closest stop in the new scenario. That results in this distribution of outcomes. Um, the purple is the existing and can see there's quite a, a range of total trip dwell times. And uh, the new scenarios, it's uh, compressed. This also accounts for the shift to off-board payment. And if you look at a summary of these things, the 50th percentile, you see we saved almost half the time, similar on the 90th percentile, but that ratio of 90th to 50th percentile, you can see that we are improving reliability in those two wider stop spacing scenarios. So that gives the um, route planner uh, options and information to act on. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. All right. Uh, Graham, if you want to turn on your video and your sound and your share your presentation. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Graham Brown. I work at uh, TransLink in Metro Vancouver. And um, I'm going to present um, on our corridor based bus performance analysis. And this is really um, about how we created some data that's useful, not about answering a specific question. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge uh, Suzanne Bell, who uh, is a colleague of mine at TransLink, who worked closely on this with me. Um, so I just going to move something here. Okay, that'll work. Uh, yeah, so the project objective was to create a spatial data set of bus routes that allows visualization of stop-to-stop -stop performance metrics, including for corridors shared by multiple routes. So like I said, we weren't answering a specific question. We were creating a, a spatial data set that would be used and useful to answer many questions. Um, and we ran up against this challenge in a lot of analysis we did, so we, we decided we'd solve it finally. So a lot of you probably have data that looks like this, where you've got each row representing a segment traversal by a vehicle. So on a particular date, you've got a particular bus trip um, and that bus traveled from stop to stop. And then you've got some metric like say passenger load for argument's sake. Um, then we've also got, of course, our road network and our bus stops. And I've just shown the, the bus routes here just to help um, kind of visualize the problem here. And you can see that these two, ro these two routes happen to overlap. Um, for a portion of one segment and for the entirety of another. So the por a portion of this segment here, oops, sorry. Anyways, you can see how they, they overlap partially. The, the, the uh, desired output looks something like the right, where we are summing the metrics for those routes that overlap. We, if we don't want to end up with multiple overlapping line features that obscure each other, we want to just look at the road network and know how many people, how many vehicle kilometers, what speed um, aggregated across all services that traverse each road section. So that's the goal. Um, so the first step uh, was to find all unique stop to stop segments um, in the schedule and in the AVL data. And so we're calling these route segments. So we want to be able to use our schedule and use our AVL data. So we need to find all of the unique data, um, all, all of the unique stop to stop pairs in those data sets. So we build a segments table, um, every unique stop to stop pair. Next step is to split the road network at intersections and at bus routes, and um, we're calling these road sections. So we take our road network, we split it up at the intersections and at the bus stops, and then we take for each route segment, we find the shortest path um, on the road sections. So for example, section uh, two or segment two from stop two to five traverses those three road sections, as you can see. And then we can save that as a shape in this table of segments. So now we know what the geography is of those stop to stop segments. And of course we do that for all segments in the, in the table. And then finally, um, what we want to do in order to know which road sections each segment traverses, we store this list of road sections for each of the segments. And so um, for segment two, you can see how um, it traverses those three segments, X, Y, and Z. And then if we were to do segment five, you can see that it also traverses uh, segment Z, section Z. Uh, I apologize, I really should have used different uh, words for segments and sections. The um, alliteration is confusing. But so the, we achieved the goal here of saying, okay, um, these, two these two segments, uh, the ones that travel from stops two to um, five and from four to five, those both share a, a section of roadway. And so that lookup table on the far right helps us know that. 
So how do we use this data? So we take our pre-existing data that I showed before, um, you know, your, your segment traversals, and these could be person traversals from our smart car data or vehicle traversals from our schedule or ABL data. Um, and then we have some metrics like load. And then we join it up to our new tables, our segments, our segment section membership and our road sections table. And we're able to attribute each of those metrics to the, the sections of roadway and where they're shared, the, um, the metrics can be added or averaged or however you want to aggregate them. So as an example of this, yeah, so that you just add those metrics up. Um, as an example of this, we had a question, um, what proportion of uh, our region has 22-ish municipalities and um, one first nation uh, within its jurisdiction, jurisdiction? So we serve that wide area. And of course, Metro Vancouver, uh, Bank City of Vancouver proper is at the center of the region, um, you know, economically and nearly geographically. So there's a lot of people traveling in Vancouver from other municipalities in the region. And the question was, what proportion of travelers on buses in the city of Vancouver started their journey elsewhere, outside of the city? And so um, using this data set, we could do something like this. If we chose a few sections of roadway in the city of Vancouver, um, highlighted in the various colors here. And then using our smart card data, we um, de developed a set of segment traversals, person segment traversals, so people traveling from stop to stop on a bus. Um, and then we um, calculated, you know, where, where they started their journey. And then for each of these uh, roadways uh, area, road, road sections, we were able to um, estimate the proportion of users uh, that started their journeys elsewhere in the region. The pie charts show those proportions with the gray being the city of Vancouver proper and the other colors being other municipalities. So this is something we, you know, a lot of these roadway sections here, um, we, did, we, we gained some geographic data for visualizing mapping purposes, and we are able to sum data um, for shared uh, road sections. And that is that. Oh, yeah, a couple of limitations. Um, incorrect route routing. Sometimes our road data does, doesn't have correct topology, overpasses and underpasses. So that uh, generates some errors. And it's also a pretty massive data set. Um, if you're looking at bus section or person section traversals in particular. Um, so those are requiring some um, new strategies for data management. Anyway, that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, on to Sadiq, if you would like to uh, unmute and turn your video on. Yep. And Graham, if you want to turn your video off, there we go. Uh, you can share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. How is, how is that looking? Can you looks, see everything? Looks great. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So my name is Sadiq Moyadeen. I'm a project engineer with Calgary Transit. Um, my lightning topic today is about open source tools for visualizing stop level performance measures, um, um, primarily for buses. And in this case, it's a case study uh, for Calgary Transit. So how can we effectively use free open, open source tools to analyze and visualize AVL and APC data? The ubiquity and popularity of cloud computing, software as a service and open source software and the like, make them attractive options in developing inexpensive or free tools to analyze large amounts of transit data. In this presentation, I'm gonna discuss an application that was developed using open source software and was used to examine stop level performance measures, mainly scheduled deviation, due to the impacts of a system-wide bus service redesign in Calgary in 2018 and 2019. Using open source software gives us opportunities to create customized, lightweight, adaptable visualizations of soft level performance measures using data that is already available to transit agencies such as AVL, APC, and GTFS data. Developing a comprehensive view like this can help planners understand, visualize, and communicate the performance of routes and how certain interventions, such as scheduling changes and infrastructure improvements, impact routes over time. So this is a screenshot of the web application that was created using open source software and shows a comparative visualization of stop level average schedule, devi average schedule, schedule deviation for all bus routes in Calgary pre and post system-wide service redesign. Um, I included a link to, to a demo of this in my last slide, which you can check out. Um, it's difficult to see in, the vis in this screenshot, but there's a user interface, user interface here where the user can select different routes and different times of day 
to display the average scheduled deviations. For example, you have the route 10 here in the afternoon rush hour, and then you pick a, pick a day of the week. So you get the average scheduled deviation for a Monday, for example. The result is a fast, uh, user-friendly, customizable application that we can use for analysis, public engagement, or communication while having full control over analysis and visualization aspects. I just want to quickly just talk about the background for kind of the driver for, for creating this application. In November 2018, Calgary Transit implemented three new crosstown bus BRT bus routes. The new BRT network was designed to serve key travel destinations and enhance crosstown transit connections and providing improvements in speed, reliability, and convenience of travel options. As part of the BRT implementation, Calgary Transit reviewed and made changes to 35 existing bus routes to develop a more effective bus network. This is one of the, the most comprehensive um, network changes that they've ever done. And the objective was um, mainly to, to make the, the system more efficient and reduce travel times um, and reduce duplication of service. And this slide is just a really quick breakdown of, of, of the development stack that was used to develop the application. On the, on the very left is the input data that was used, which is GTFS, APC, and AV, AVL data. And the middle is this, the software tools that were used and the right is the output um, data that was obtained. Um, and the process, uh, the first process involved um, the data prep side, um, you know, removing null, null values, formatting date time and collecting relevant parameters. Um, in the middle section there, it shows um, the tools that were used. So there's po uh, PostGIS, which is a, a plugin for Postgres, which is an open source relational database. Mapbox, which is the mapping platform, uh, which is a highly customizable um, mapping framework um, and very fast and, and effective. And finally, uh, a front end user uh, development uh, framework. In this case, uh, I use React, um, but there's others out there. Um, I just like using React. I think it's really effective. So, um, so th th those are the three main kind of uh, open source tools that were used. Um, and the outputs that were gained out of that, um, given the input parameters and the database queries, um, we get some of the some of the different uh, performance measures. Um, and in this particular application, scheduled deviation was the was the one that I used. I'm going to quickly just talk about the methodology. Um, since I want stop level scheduled deviation for every single stop, um, I ended up using the EVL vehicle position data set, which records vehicle positions every 45 seconds. And then using the vehicle position data and associated timestamp, I want to get an approximate arrival time at every stop for every trip on every day in the data set. I match the vehicle uh, position GPS point to the nearest bus stop for a given trip. Um, since the AVL is gathering location every 45 seconds, the GPA, GPS points will likely not match up with the exact bus stop location. So what I did was I matched the points um, if it's within a 15 meter range of the bus stop. However, there are occasions when the vehicle positions are bunched up in the same location close together within similar timestamp. In this case, I take the earliest timestamp of, of a bunch of points. This will effectively give us the closest possible arrival timestamp to the bus stop location so we can determine scheduled deviation, or in other words, the difference between the actual time of arrival and the scheduled arrival stop time. In so in conclusion, uh, Using uh, open source software allows us to quickly mock, mock up and analyze APC and AVL data for free or with minimal investment. For, particular for this particular application, we can understand the performance of routes and how certain interventions impact routes over time. This creates a highly customizable, adaptable application that is tailored to transit agencies' visualization examples, for example, internal analysis, public engagement, or simply uh, communications. And finally, it can be used uh, to utilize for various stop level performance measures, which are useful for uh, transit agencies. The links are right there on the bottom for, for the visualization if you wanna check that out. And then there's also a GitHub page um, for some of the source code. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Very cool, Sadiq. Uh, Jeremy, if you would like to share your screen. That working? Great, you're good to go. Great. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for being with us today. Um, my name is Jeremy Strauss. I'm a senior transportation planner with Foursquare Integrated Transportation Planning. We're a transportation planning consulting firm headquartered outside Washington, D.C. 
Um, we do transit service planning and operations, performance monitoring, TDM programs, uh, lots of development of technical tools and data visualization. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some work that we did today with Maryland Transit Administration um, on the performance monitoring program, developing a grading system for them. And okay, there we go. Um, so just some background in 2017, um, MTA Maryland redesigned uh, their core bus system. Uh, they actually rebranded their whole system. It was called Baltimore Link. Um, we did a lot of the work with them for that. They, they built a sort of downtown grid-like service uh, with three sets of routes, high frequency service called City Link, a local service called Local Link and Express Routes um, and more commuter type routes called Express Bus Link. Um, they were looking for a streamlined way to monitor their performance, figure out what could be defined as poor performance for bus routes, um, as well as uh, modify their performance monitoring system, which was very disjointed and sort of a piecemeal approach, no former guidelines. Um, having done a lot of the work with them on the redesign, they came to us for assistance with that. Um, and they were also looking for something to implement uh, to, that would align with their annual service planning calendar, which calls for major service changes once a year and sort of more minor service changes throughout the year. Um, so we built a performance monitoring program for them around four pillars that they uh, operate on. I'll go through them now as well as the performance metrics that fall under each um, and the targets that we develop for performance for each um, uh, against which to grade the routes. So the first is safety. Um, overcrowding is the only metric in this category. It's defined um, by a load standard for um, each service type uh, by time period. We've heard some other folks speak about that during these presentations. Um, we're aiming for 1% or fewer overcrowded trips in a period. That is where the maximum load on the bus is not um, exceeding the specified load standard. Efficiency, um, three metrics in this category, operating cost per passenger, passengers per revenue hour, and passengers per revenue trip. Um, and we're, we're aiming to um, meet or exceed MTA's performance based on uh, past performance, at least in the pre-COVID era in that category. Um, the third is reliability. Here we're looking at schedule performance by final trip time point, as well as an average of, of time point arrivals. Um, that is essentially the same thing as on-time performance and the target uh, there is 80% based on sort of an industry average slash standard. Uh, the last thing we're looking at is customer service, uh, which will allow us um, by looking at customer complaints per 100,000 boardings, as well as um, rate your ride, which is MTA's trip, ride, trip uh, rating system, rather, to see what is the data in the other three categories showing us um, how, are the, how are customer opinions aligning uh, with what we're seeing in the actual data. Um, so we do uh, a full grading system, which I'll show you on the next slide as well as final grades for each route. And the percentages that you see next to the names of those four pillars um, are the percentage that each of those pillars goes into the final grade calculation. So on a monthly basis, we're um, rating MTA, analyzing MTA's data. We, we process a tremendous amount of data using a SQL server, as well as a series of scripts uh, created through the R programming language. Um, and this allows them to back up service change proposals and decisions with hard data, including how customers feel about the service, as I mentioned. So all the metrics within those four pillars are normalized to an A through F grading scale, including plus and minus variations there. As you can see on this route report card, uh, we produce these again every month, as well as every service pick, which is when the uh, operators will choose their runs. It happens about three times a year for MTA Maryland. And we also provide them more detailed spreadsheets um, of the data, but they like this quick format of the report card as something to show the stakeholders. And we can also look at trends over time and see you know, if something is hitting a B or a C over time and it's going down or going up, what are some interventions that we might want to explore there. Um, one of the cooler things that we do also are performance monitoring dashboards using the Tableau system. We're able to hone in on, on routes at the route level direction level um, for a month at a time. In, in this uh, example, you see overcrowded trip percentage by route. You see this route is struggling with some overcrowding during certain time periods, is, and you see the 1% target highlighted there. Here's schedule performance by time point, which again is just like on-time performance. You see this is rather than um, trying to go below that target for overcrowding, you're of course trying to exceed 80% as much as possible. 
This is trip performance by service type and specifically average passengers per trip for their CityLink service, which is 12 color-coded uh, high-frequency routes. And you can see um, the target there, which again is based on past performance. Um, my favorite thing about the, the performance monitoring dashboard is the grade trend sheet, which allows us to look at over any specified time period, how routes are doing um, within the various categories. You see here for reliability, which is again is on time performance, this route um, improved quite a bit over time. And you can analyze that in conjunction with safety data to see whether overcrowding was a factor in on time performance. Um, this is a route that was, was implemented to serve um, a job site. You see the point where there was a job center expansion Efficiency, which is highlighted in red, went up quite a bit um, with the greater amount of ridership, but that can sometimes come at the expense of overcrowding. As you see, overcrowding start to dip there. And sometimes adding more trips can uh, decrease efficiency as well, as you see there. Um, anyhow, I think that's my time. I really appreciate it. And um, I'd like to reach out for more information on route reporting, performance monitoring, or development of guidelines. We'd be happy to touch base. Great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, Sam, last but certainly not least. Okay, just um, let me know when it pops up. Yeah, you're visible. Just before you start, I'll just remind people, it looks like we'll have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, I've seen a few pop up. If you can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom chat to ask a few questions, and anything we don't get to, um, I recommend asking those questions on the Google Drive document that is linked at the Union Station page. But hopefully we'll have a few time, a few minutes for some questions at the end. But uh, Sam, go ahead. Hey, uh, first of all, greetings from Toronto, Canada. Uh, my name is Sam Benoud. I'm a senior advisor in the customer analytics team at Metrolinks. And the focus of this presentation is one that continues to be a challenge for many organizations. That is how to communicate information and insights in a meaningful way, particularly through the use of data visualization. I'll share with you a few examples of how we have adapted and tailored our delivery to the information needs of different audience groups. Every month we create and share a comprehensive KPI package comprised of a series of performance maps and complementary deep dive analyses on specific focus areas. Each map provides a unique perspective on network performance by honing in on specific time dimension or mode of transport, such as year-to-date ridership, weekday peak ridership, weekday off-peak, weekend, and it's split by bus and rail, et cetera, et cetera. The maps which are created using VBA macros and populated with transactional data across all fare systems, they show ridership and revenue KPIs at different levels of detail. Uh, some of the measures include things like total boardings, average daily volumes, year over year percent change at a station, corridor and network level. Other notable features include icons representing stations undergoing a construction event for added context. And the bubbles are a dimension representing relative year over year percent change at the stations. These maps are simple visualization tools that quickly draw attention to specific focus areas and consequently prompt further investigation. So for example, a cursory view may lead to questions such as, why is Pickering Station on the Lakeshore East Line, the red line, outperforming Ajax, Whitby, and Oshawa? Or if we turn our attention to the gray corridor representing Up Express, why is Pearson Airport not growing as fast as, fast as the other three commuter stations? What does this infer about our customer segments? What does it infer about our market share at Pearson Airport? So lots of interesting questions begin to emerge from a simple glance at a relatively simple visual. These maps provide an avenue to convey the health of our network to SMT visually, holistically, and in a predictable form. As a result, we have secured the confidence of our SMT when we make recommendations and have helped to create an environment where data drives decision making, all because the message that we're trying to deliver isn't lost in translation. UpExpress is a success story for Metrolinx uh, with sustained near double digit growth and strong customer satisfaction scores. To continue this trajectory, teams like marketing, operations, customer experience, they need access to clean and recent data to develop their strategies and make sound business decisions. To support and enable them, we have built two automated self-serve dashboards using Tableau and Tableau Online that reduce turnaround times and enhance data accessibility. The dashboard presently on display is the result of blending transactional data across multiple fare systems and integrating with operational real-time service information data. It provides ridership and revenue KPIs across different dimensions and responds dynamically to end user filter selections, which are grouped together in the upper right corner. Note that revenue de details have been redacted due to commercial sensitivity throughout this dashboard. 
The dashboard begins with the highest level of information, overall radish of revenue for the defined period, as well as year over year growth that's been adjusted for business dates. It concludes with the most detailed level of information at the bottom, showing top performing train trips by ridership, by revenue, and provides context as to how often those train trips were two car versus three car consists, which is important from a service planning perspective. A quick use case for this dashboard, let's say depending on your fare channel strategy, we can see that Presto fare cards are doing exceedingly well, while paper ticket sales from service desk are a bit lackluster. And what's more is that Presto is showing consistent year over year growth, where a service desk is showing a decline. This could be vital information for the business to take action. In the same vein as the previous dashboard, this utilization versus capacity dashboard uh, blends modeled transactional data and operational RTSI data together, where the model transaction data set is the product of applying business logic to map transactions to specific train trips based on the timestamp of the transaction and the departure time of the train. It effectively shows the net onboard ridership and train capacity for each trip by station and by direction of travel, accounting for both boardings and alightings at each station. End users can toggle the filters as they wish to adjust for different dates, times of day, or specific stations. The red horizontal lines represent the actual capacity of the train trip in that departure window, and the vertical bars represent the net onboard passenger counts as the train departs each station in sequence. We can scroll across to view this information for the entire service day, and we can see that during the PM peak in the 4.15 window, we have a capacity issue before the train even leaves the first station, which is quite insightful. In addition to helping us monitor changes to evolving customer usage patterns, this dashboard helps with many other questions as well, such as how are trains being utilized as they pass through each station? Are capacity levels on board the vehicles a cause for concern from a customer experience or safety perspective? How are operational decisions around fleet assignment impacting customers? Are we assigning three car consists at the right times? How can marketing campaigns be optimized? What stations should we target? What times of day are best depending on the target segment? And can we support our retail partners by helping them optimize their hours of operation at our stations according to demand? Among the abundance of complexity that we have to navigate to deliver value, it is easy to forget the importance of keeping your audience and your stakeholders in mind. To build a reputation, to be persuasive and put steam behind your recommendations, how results are conveyed, the format, the timing, the medium are equally as important as the content. Mm -hmm. So every opportunity to provide data education or to make data available and accessible to both technical and non-technical audiences, be it through complex uh, ML model outputs or dashboards or simple summary tables, is a chance to showcase the true potential of data and earn credibility in your organization. And I think that's more or less my time. So thank you for your attention and thanks for your time. Great, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sam. Um, all right, so that concludes the presentations. Um, we've got a few minutes here for questions. Uh, I can see some people have been putting some questions into their, uh, into the chat. Um, so not into the chat, if, if you can put them into the question and answer portion, I'm going to start my video. Um, maybe if uh, the presenters are willing to start up their video, we can have a little bit of a round table um, thing here. Um, I have a question maybe to start with, and this is for uh, everybody. Maybe we can go in order of, of, of people who were um, presenting if they're interested. Um, to what extent is this, like these are some in incredibly cool looking visualizations. Um, you're pulling a lot of data sources together um, and that's, you know, the power of that is, is very clear. What is, how much of this is public facing and uh, accessible from by the public and understandable by the public and how much of it is internal? And then maybe the follow up to that is, um, you know, what do you, what are the challenges and barriers to, you know, getting a lot of this information, um, maybe setting the financially sensitive stuff aside uh, out to the, uh, out to the open. So I don't know if Howard, you want to take a, a first shot at that? Okay. Well, um, having having the data accessible by the public is um, always like sort of the end goal uh, of what we're aiming for when we're upgrading to uh, like Power BI vi uh, Visual, for example. Um, one of the key functionalities of that is that you can create an existing report and embed it onto our website uh, directly uh, rather than having to create charts uh, visuals manually. Um, so there's a, uh, there's a better integration that way. Um, in terms of challenges, um, for one thing, um, we have, 
releasing data that is no problem, but we have to make sure the data that it is we are releasing is is purposeful, and um, we want to make sure that, that we're comfortable releasing uh, the the um, the data, whether it's on time performance, uh, uh, ridership information, because the more you release, obviously people will that will have more questions um, about about the data in general, and we have to be prepared to answer those questions. So. Um, it's a two-way street. Absolutely. Uh, Joey, any thoughts? If he's still here, he may have dropped off. Oh yeah, sorry. Actually, could you repeat the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how much of, uh, we've been sort of showing some dashboards uh, of, of some of this stuff and you had a little bit of performance evaluation. How much of that is sort of easy to access and learn about from the public and how much is sort of more internal facing and, and what are some of the challenges to getting that data out there so that people can learn in more detail about their system. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, the large majority of our data products are internal. Um, part of that is just, uh, well, some of that is our IS or IT department and how we structure things. You know, I think a lot of people are much more comfortable with not making things publicly accessible, um, both from like a network security perspective, but also a resource perspective. We've been using the R shiny server for a lot of our internal dashboards. And I don't think we know how that would scale <clears throat> outside of the organization. Uh, for some projects, we have a shinyapps.io account. So that stuff is shared publicly. But um, you know, we have an open data portal through the state that we contribute to, but it's not the level of detail that you would need, for example, to fit the models that I was producing producing or to run those service scenarios. Right. Yeah. And I guess the, the age old question for me is, is sort of why not, um, Graham, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so we share a lot of our data through a, a dashboard online, um, our, our transit service performance review and each year we publish this, uh, through a series of dashboards. We just actually started producing dashboards a year ago maybe yeah i think last year is the first time and um this is a series of, of great visualizations there are really you know lots of wealth of data there people can download summary tables um it's on tableau public which is a free service as well as arcgis online we use both of those platforms for different things um, tableau is coming a long ways and it's a uh, geographic representation of data um but uh, arcgis still has you know of course it's natively built for that purpose. So um, yeah, and uh, it's, it's, it does generate questions. I, I agree with, with Howard that, um, you know, you, you think you might be saving yourself some work by publishing some data, but uh, you're also opening up your, uh, yourself to a, a lot of potential work <laughs> to answer questions. Um, so yeah, um, that's what I've got to say on that. Yeah, it, it sounds like that, um, that you've sort of, the stuff you've been doing is a little bit more publicly accessible uh, maybe than is typical. So it, I'm interested to see that uh, you haven't had too much, um, too much trouble. Um, I see you've also sort of distilled down uh, a lot of things into sort of a letter grade, so to speak, and that can be. Uh, oh, that, yeah, that was oh, someone else. Oh, that was somebody else, sorry. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, but if anybody wants to check out the TransLink TSPR, you can just do uh, right. it. Yeah. And um, yeah. that's quite, quite a, a good, good representation of what we're doing in terms of open data. Right, sorry. Um, Sadiq, uh, you, I, <laughs> we probably could have saved each other a lot of time. I spent most of my thesis trying to get uh, scheduled deviation data for Calgary Transit. Um, so interesting to see uh, your approach. Oh, you're muted, by the way. Uh, interesting to see your approach was a little different than mine. I ended up using APC data. But uh, yep. um, that application, you said there was a demo available. Is there sort of a, a and culture and attitude of sort of getting that out there and making it visible to the public? Or is there um, some so, uh, yeah, th this was kind of a small scale kind of uh, proof of concept kind of situation here. So, um, and it is live, obviously. So, you know, the public and customers can, can view it. Um, I know Calgary Transit does release some type of, you know, performance data, on-time performance data, but uh, I don't know how much value it gives customers. And it obviously doesn't go into the granularity that, you know, something like the visualization I created goes into. Um, and there may be a reason for that, obviously, as some of the other panelists already, already discussed. Um, 
personally, I have a different approach to that. Um, obviously, as my talk, you know, talked about uh, kind of open open source kind of uh, idea. Um, I, I I come from the kind of you know perspective that you know we should be kind of releasing a little bit more detailed granular data to, to customers just so they can see. Um, but I mean, speaking just kind of the open source kind of aspect uh, to this as well. Um, you know, there 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 is um, some pushback, obviously, from from IT departments and such about kind of other potential um, avenues for re for releasing data or presenting data, because you know you obviously have your your standard Esri type product, um, but there is so much out there, right? And you can create so many customized different um, types of visualizations that could be tailored to a specific type of message you're trying to get across. Um, and I just think that's that's really the value in some of the some of the open source tools that are out there. Um, but if if agencies are willing to go that route, um, that's kind of a different uh, different discussion. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm kind of hearing a little bit that uh, that it can sometimes be more of an IT problem or more of an IT hesitancy and security risk than it is a yeah. policy. And that, I mean, that is, that, is a, that is an issue that, I mean, that is a struggle that government agencies are going through over the last little while. Like where does open source fit into, into, um, into government? Cause then it's, it's still, it's not open source isn't new, but I feel that in some cases, um, the application to kind of a, a public kind of agency is. Um, and I, I think it's something that's kind of being worked through right now um, in terms of, you know, how, how, where does it fit in, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Jeremy, my apologies. That was your presentation with the, with the wonderful grading system. Is that something that uh, is easily visible by the public or visible at all by the public? No problem. Um, it is not visible by the public. There was talk of, of doing that when we started. Um, and I think we've just kind of, the client has never really gotten around to it. I think that um, it's used extensively internally, um, especially the dashboards and the report cards are shared uh, with other folks in the agency. Um, I think there was some concern about, I mentioned the customer service grade, but you know, saying, hey, this route got an A in reliability for this month and customers thinking something else and there being some, some backlash on that as it has a D in customer service and an A in reliability. Um, so, it is used extensively internally, and I think I think eventually um, a lot of it should go public. It's it's a fluid system. We're making adjustments to it and to the guide the guidelines documents that we have produced for them that uh, accompany the performance monitoring that actually show the standards. I I, I think eventually will be made public, um, but we're able to make adjustments to it frequently. We recently made an adjustment to um, make the overcrowding standard a bit more. Um, stringent, for example, to, to really reward routes that, that are able to have extreme social distancing on them, for example. So um, right now, yeah, it's, it's pretty much internal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's always that balance between, you know, prevent, providing people the information uh, and then making sure it's well explained and, and well understood yeah. so that it doesn't get uh, misinterpreted. But, you know, my, my view is that, you know, you got to kind of back up what you're saying and, uh, you know, explain yourself and yeah that's a lot of work but uh, it's, it's probably worth it Sam I know uh, Metrolinx does a lot of sort of at least internal insights about about you know every pretty much every aspect of their performance I wonder uh, if there's any plans or, or how how much of that information um, is going to end up being public facing uh, if at all and or you know what the sort of thinking is there yeah, certainly. Um, so lots of lots of great points, and and um, certainly won't repeat them uh, all. But but I can say that um, Metrolinks recently we've sort of you know lit the fuse on on getting on board with a, with an open data directive. Um, though our internal or sorry our our data products are mostly for internal consumption, we are trying to find new opportunities and new ways to publish that data set or those data sets. Um, even if it means to you know aggregate to a certain level that doesn't compromise commercial sensitivity. Um, and to, you know, I have to agree with what Graham said. Sometimes, you know, you think you're trying to, um, you're try, trying to save yourself time. And in fact, it only generates more work in the long run. And to Howard's point, um, you are, you know, it has to be purposeful, the release of this data. But at the same time, there is a, you know, monetary value to the data sets that you're going to be publishing. And so you have to balance out the commercial sensitivity with that monetary value, plus the value that that could be ascertained by opening up your data sets and, and people creating new ways of, of using, consuming and creating new tools that could potentially be useful for the organization down the road. So a big balancing act there, um, but we are look, certainly looking for opportunities to, to open up. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, everybody, for that for that answer. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of interesting thoughts. Uh, if there's any more questions, feel free to put them in. Howard, there's been a little bit of interest in in integrating Power BI and specific uh, specifically, um, so you might get a few questions on the Google Doc there, um, and uh, maybe maybe a, some a quick quick question on that. Did you um, did you have a lot of hurdles in adapting the data you had and, and getting skill sets on board um, to work with that kind of data, or or did um, did that go pretty smoothly? I guess. I would say uh, there, there has been a, a quite a bit of learning curve between us um, at GRT and also our um, our software vendor, whom we have a long-term sort of a collaborative relationship dating back to when they first created um, TDRS using the SSRS uh, uh, reporting server. So uh, it, it's not easy. A lot there's a lot of the backend stuff that I a lot of hurdles on the back end that uh, even I'm not really too familiar with, but, uh, uh, but once that was out of the way, um, it just opened up a, a lot more opportunities. Uh, it could also be like a timing thing too, because Power BI has always been constantly updated throughout the years. So the challenges that we had a couple of years ago may not be an issue now uh, with all these latest updates. I get the sense that there's a pretty continual update. Tableau is, is also sort of continually making improvements and, and ArcGIS online as well. Um, all right, I'll give it a second just for a bit more. Um, yeah, there's some questions uh, for, for you, Jeremy, um, about determining the weights. Um, it's always a question you have when you have weights like that. How, how are the weights and sort of aggregation determined on those scorecards? Um, did you go sort of through a consultation process or, or how did that work? Sure. So there was, a, there's a lot of back and forth. What we do is we um, rate each route uh, on a scale from zero being an F to four being an A essentially on, on a variety of, of different metrics at a much more granular level than I was able to, to show in this presentation. Um, so we might look at um, you know, on time performance by time point percentage, for example, um, for a route in the westbound direction during the AM peak period and use a, a sliding scale system where we rate it on a zero to four scale. Um, so if the standard is 80%, anything above that might be a four, anything five percentage points below that might be a three, for example. Um, and then we have an extensive averaging process where we'll create a grade for that route for that metric reliability um, at the weekday, Saturday, and Sunday level. Um, so we'll produce weekday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we'll normalize those zero to four sc um, scores using a grading rubric that we've created um, from A through F, including plus and minus variations, um, just like going to school. So. <laughs> um, it has all the fun of that. Uh, the percentages that I that I had put at the top of that slide for safety, efficiency, reliability, and customer service, um, it's there's a final grade also produced for, for every route. Um, it's 30% each for safety, efficiency, and reliability. Um, and then 10% of the grade is the customer service grade. The thinking being that the customer service data is sort of validating or invalidating what, what is showing in the other three facets of data. So, so as not to double count that, that would have a, a, a lower uh, percentage factor into the final grade. So it's essentially normalizing lots of things from zero to four and then averaging at, at different levels. Right, yeah. I remember uh, my experience on the, the Calgary's Green Line LRT at one point, there was a multiple accounts evaluation, they called it, which was, and the question that always came up was how those weightings were determined for each of those sort of pillars. And so, I, you know, there's always a somewhat of a methodology and it's also somewhat arbitrary mm -hmm. based on values and stuff. Yeah. All right, uh, great. I think we're at time. So uh, thank you very much, uh, all six of you for your presentations, um, all very interesting. I hope to see all of those wonderful data visualizations uh, available to me as a public user <laughs> in short order. Um, that's, my, uh, that's my high expectation. Um, so thank you and thanks to all of our viewers for attending. We will be back uh, for plenary three uh, at three o'clock. So you can head back to the union page and join us there. Thanks everybody. Great. Thank you for having us. Yeah.